What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network here for a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the principals and associates, as well as the founding sponsors of this great open source organization. Today, in newsletter number 52, on June 26th, 2019, this week's newsletter announces a pending disclosure of minor vulnerabilities for older Bitcoin Core releases, suggests changing testing of release candidates for Lightning Network software, and describes a proposed technique to make Bitcoin Core nodes a bit more resistant to ellipse attacks. Also included are our regular sections on BEC32 sending support, popular stack exchange topics, and notable changes to popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items. Update Bitcoin Core to at least version 0.17.1. Two minor vulnerabilities that affect older releases of Bitcoin Core are scheduled to be disclosed around August 1st. Neither vulnerabilities affect versions 0.17.1, which was released on December 25th, 2018, or later versions. We express our gratitude to Bitcoin Core contributor Practical Swift for reporting the vulnerability. Help test C Lightning and LND release candidates. Both C Lightning and LND are in the process of testing release candidates for their next versions. Experienced users of either program are encouraged to help test the release candidates so that any remaining bugs can be identified and fixed before the final release. News. Differentiating peers based on ASN instead of address prefixes. An ellipse attack prevents a full node from making even one connection to another honest node, allowing the attacker to prevent the node from learning about the most proof-of-work blockchain or from broadcasting time-sensitive transactions. To help prevent ellipse attacks, a Bitcoin Core full node will ordinarily split its eight outgoing connections between nodes whose IP addresses differ in their first 16 bits. Uh, for the, for example, slash one six, many ISPs have uh, only have IP address in a smaller number of different uh, sixteen ranges, or al allocate their addresses to customers in a way that makes it difficult for customers to choose which prefix they get, making it harder for an attacker to acquire a large diversity of IP addresses from which they can perform an ellipse, eclipse attack. However, there are large ISPs, such as cloud computing operators, that manage multiple facilities that each use different IP ranges, making it possible for customers to more easily acquire addresses from multiple prefixes. One possible solution to that problem would be to track which IP addresses are controlled by which ISPs and then partitioning the node's outgoing connections amongst different ISPs regardless of what addresses they use. For example, this might be able to group together all IP addresses from Amazon's AWS, no matter what region the customer used for their services, servers. ISP to IP addresses. Information is available from a, for, from a whole internet routing table. Unfortunately, those tables are over a gigabyte in size, too large to practically handle with full notes. Peter Woolley has been working on a compact encoding of just the information needed to identify different ISPs by their IP addresses using the ISP's autonomous system number, ASN. Woolley's table reduces the extra storage requirement to around one megabyte. During this week's IRC meeting of Bitcoin Core developers, Woolley and Matt Corolo asked whether one megabyte of extra data was small enough to, dis uh, to distribute with Bitcoin Core in order to improve its ability to ensure connections to peers on different networks. Meeting participants expressed support for the idea before spending time debating some implementation details. Based on that feedback, we expect to see more development on this idea. BEC32 sending support. Week 15 in a, of 24 in a series of about allowing the people you pay to access all of SegWit's multiple benefits. Before SegWit was activated, developers discussed what format we use for native SegWit addresses, with some developers suggesting that a new format was an opportunity to make addresses that were easier to read and transcribe. 
developer Gregory Maxwell made this point rather efficient by asking other developers to call him up and try to successfully communicate a mixed cased legacy base 58 check address to him over the phone. If there was a communication error in just a single character, even just whether the character was uppercase or lowercase, both parties would need to go back and painstakingly try to locate the error. But 173 back 32 addresses were able to resolve both of these concerns. They use only a single case, lowercase preferred most of the time, but uppercase can be used for QR codes uh, for improved efficiency. And they use an error correction code for the checksum so that they can help users locate errors while ensuring typos will be caught an overwhelming percentage of the time. However, as wallets and services consider upgrading to support both back 32 sending and receiving, we think it's worth reminding any reluctant implementers about this key user benefit feature of back 32 addresses. So we've automated part of Maxwell's old phone test to allow you to privately uh, evaluate the relative difficulty of transcribing legacy and native SegWit addresses. If you click the following link, open into a new tab, you will find a recording of two addresses paying the same hash value. You can type the address into the appropriate box below, which will turn red immediately if you enter a wrong character, case sensitive. Note to help improve accuracy and eliminate problems with locale specific letter pronunciation, we read each letter in the file using a phonetic alphabet. Uh, for example, alpha stands for A, bravo stands for B, etc. And this is a test for you at home. If you uh, want to listen to this reading of the base 58 check and back 32 addresses, uh, this will take a minute and 33 seconds. And it will show you how the error detection is much more benefit for native SegWit address. If you found the BAC32 address much easier to transcribe accurately, then that means that the design of BAC32 were successful at meeting one of their goals for the new address format. Users who discover this benefit of BAC32 are more likely to want to use BAC32 addresses in situations where they need to read or transcribe addresses. And so they'll be more likely to use your software or service if it supports sending to BAC32 addresses. Selected Q&A from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. Bitcoin Stack Exchange is one of the first places the very Optech contributors look for answers to their questions or when we have a few spare moments of time to help curious or confused users. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. How can I mitigate concerns about the gap limit? Enrique inquires about potential loss of funds when using a hierarchical deterministic wallet and exceeding the address gap limit. Andrew Chow and Bitcoin Hodler explains that, with, that while there are no loss of funds when exceeding the gap limit, the limit should be considered when restoring from backup or generating addresses outside of that wallet. And here we have this question by Enrique. I want to accept BTC payments, but I'm a bit worried about the gap limit. I've read our wallet could miss the funds beyond the gap limit if that happened. But I also read that we could fix that easily increasing the gap limit in Electrum, for example. So I'm a bit confused right now. Is it possible to lose the funds due to gap limit? Or what problem is just something we can fix easily in our wallet changing the settings? And here, this answer by Andrew Chow. You won't ever lose funds due to the gap limit. They don't become lost forever. You can still retrieve them. The gap limit is really only an issue for restoring backups. When restoring a backup, the gap limit is supposed is used by the wallet to know how many addresses to look ahead in order to ensure that all the funds are seen. If the gap limit is too small, then a long string of unused addresses can be it can cause the wallet to miss funds at high, higher index addresses as it does not generate them in restoring the backup. The gap limit is not an issue for normal users. It only affects backup restoration and when doing such restores, it is easy to just increase the gap limit if you find not all of your funds were seen by the wallet. And then here this comment by the Bitcoin hodler, the gap limit is not only an issue for restoring backups. If his e-commerce software generates 100 consecutive receiving addresses for potential customers that never pay, the gap limit had better be larger than 1,000. 
I'm assuming the addresses are generated outside of Electrum using the expo. Here, great question. Uh, jumping into the next. How do Bitcoin nodes update the UTXO set when their latest blocks are replaced? Peter Woolley describes how undo files are used to update the UTXO set after the block reorganization. Jumping into this question by Michal. Let's say Bitcoin node has 100 blocks, then, the receive, then he receives another two blocks. Now it has 102 blocks. But how now he receives block 103, and this block is from another chain, and our node can have, has to remove the blocks 102 and 101 and 102 and replace them with this chain with blocks 101, 102, and 103. So now I must rewind UTXO set back to node 100 and update with the transaction from newly received nodes 101 and 103. How nodes make this rollback of UTXO set? This question is rather confusing, talking about both nodes and blocks and UTXOs with, with these 100 numbers, uh, but into Peter Woolley's answer. Bitcoin Core, since version 0 0.8, maintains the undo files that contain the information necessary to undo the effect of a block on the UTXO set. If you, in a way, you can see blocks as authenticated patches uh, to be applied to the UTXO set. They list new outputs to be added and which inputs to be spent. In order to support rolling back the UTXO set, undo blocks are created as a side effect of validation. Structures that contain the UTXO that were spent. When rolling back, the undo file are applied in reverse order. Thanks for this great answer, Peter. Next question. Is there a reason why Bitcoin Core does not implement a BIP39? Andrew Chow explains how Bitcoin Core's current wallet structure plus security concerns about BIP39's use of pay, uh, PBKDF2 produced obstacles against its implementation. This question by K. Alvin Eli by K. C. Elvin Elvin. Is there a specific reason why BIP39 is not added to Bitcoin Core? Seems very trivial to add, and I'm confused why it is not in there. And here this answer by Andrew. BIP39 is not in Bitcoin Core largely for implementation reasons and because BIP39 is not as secure as it could be. The structure of Bitcoin Core's wallet does not really allow for BIP39 to be implemented. The current structure does not allow for 512-bit seed as BIP39 specifies. And adding it would require some significant changes to the wallet code. Uh, implementing BIP39 would also require implementation of PBKDF2, although that is not very hard. Also more generally, many Bitcoin Core contributors do not consider BIP39 to be secure. It uses PBKDF2, which is generally regarded to be fairly weak uh, KDF, uh, so it is not considered to be good for secure storage of all your Bitcoin. Some software, such as Electrum, uses BIP39 in the past, but have switched to using their own monomic algorithm because of the weakness in BIP39. BIP39 monomics have some other issues as well, such as versioning numbers, or rather a lack thereof, and use of the field word list. Electrum has documented their reason for why they do not support BIP39, and those reasons are the same for Bitcoin Core. Thank you, Andrew, for this answer. And now the next question. Is a signature private key required to accept payments over the Lightning Network? Yuyo Ogawa asks about the possibility of accepting Lightning Network payments without having to keep the private key online. Rene Picard points out that not only does Bold 11 require signed invoices, but the updating of channels also necess necessitates signatures and thus private keys. Here, this question. Um, by Yuyova and edited by Merch. To one, create an invoice, and two, accept payments in Lightning Network, the node has to be online. But does the node need to sign the creating invoice or to accepting the payment? We do not have private keys online to receiving Bitcoin and on-chain transactions. Rather, we just need to sign the sending transaction with the private key. It would be nice if Lightning Network nodes do not have the private key online for accepting payments. And here this answer by Renee. Yes, invoices are signed according to Bold 11, 
One reason we do this is to fight denial of service attacks. It would not have the, if I would have to sign my invoice, I could create an invoice for any node. That node would not have the pre-image for that payment hash and routing to the payment would fail all the time. While I can imagine other processes that do not require a signature in the invoice, we still need the private key and signature to update the payment channel on which the payment is coming in. This is needed to accept the offered hashed time lock contract and to settle it. Since we certainly need a signature for the HTLCs, we can use them for invoices as well. Thank you very much, Renee, for that answer. And finally, notable code and documentation changes. This week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, Eclair, Lipsec P256K1, and the Bitcoin improvement proposals. This Bitcoin Core change adds the set wallet flags RPC that can be used to toggle flags for the wallet, including a new avoid reuse flag that, when needed, will prevent the wallet from spending Bitcoin receiving received to an address that the wallet has already used for spending. This prevents blockchain analysis from being able to associate multiple spends with the same wallet through spending address reuse, an attack on privacy often exploited using dust attacks. This new flag is disabled by default, but when enabled, it can be combined with the avoid partial spends configuration option described in newsletter 6 to ensure that all Bitcoins received to the same address so far are spent at the same time, ensuring that there are none left over in a balance that would require passing a special option to spend. This Bitcoin Core change causes Bitcoin Core to always bind to the default port when listening on Tor, for example, port 8333 for mainnet, even if it is configured to listen to other ports for normal clearnet traffic. The previous behavior where it listened to uh, on the custom port of all interfaces made it easy to find the clearnet identity of any Tor node that used a custom Bitcoin port. This Bitcoin core change removes the mempool replacement configuration option. This option configurement uh, configured whether or not the node would accept replacement of transactions into the mempool according to BIP125 opt-in replaced by few rules. This option was added in the last moment during the version 0.12 release cycle and developers have argued that it's almost never what miners or node operators want. Miners because it reduces the profitability and node operators because even if the operator does not like opt-in replaced by fee, disabling this option prevents them from receiving warnings about replacements. Users who do not like RBF are better off ignoring transactions that opt into RBF until they've been confirmed, as described in BIP125. It's believed that almost all nodes are currently using the default option, and the only miners known to be using the option recently confirmed there was a misconfiguration on their part. So the option is being removed for lack of use and because there was no reason to recommend anyone use it. This Bitcoin core change makes the create multi and add multi signature RPCs always return a legacy paid to script hash multi sig address if any of the public keys use an uncompressed pub key. Per pip143, uncompressed pub keys must not be used with the current version of SegWit, version 0. Bitcoin core won't relay spends from SegWit outputs that use uncompressed pub keys, and it's possible that the future software will make them permanently unspendable. Piers, you got to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. Thank you again for all the founding sponsors, principals, and associates of this great open source organization. If you have a question, don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you for your support on the Telecom. Piers, see you on the next show. Bye bye.